praise the Lord again. Are you well? Are you well? Uh, thank you, uh, praise and worship team. Because I do recall in December 1989, we walked around with Ross looking for where we shall worship. December 1989. And we were attracted to Deliverance Church not because of anything else, but because of the praise and worship that we had that day. Amen? And the number I do recall, courtesy of Reverend Commanders, Bishop, it used to go, Nime pata tikiti, tikiti ya mbinguni. Nime pata tikiti. Probably we may be asking ourselves, do we have a ticket to heaven? And that is how the song was. That in me pata tikiti, tikiti ya mbingu, ya mbinguni. And therefore we joined Deliverance Church the following Sunday, December 1989. So thank you very much. God bless you. You can imagine how many may have heard and will desire from outside to join us as a family. So we are grateful to God for that. We also want to say thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to share uh, this morning. Thank you, man of God, woman of God, and the team that you are working together for trusting us uh, that much. I'm aware that uh, we, uh, we've just ended our 40-day prayer and fasting. Uh, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, we will be reading from Joshua chapter 15, 5, sorry. Joshua chapter, chapter 5. And we shall do the whole of it. Because it's not a long uh, chapter. So I will be waiting for the media team to give us that. Um, so Joshua chapter 5. And uh, the title of my message is Circumcising the Foreskin of Your Heart Again and again. Circumcising the foreskin of your heart again and again. So we shall read. I will be taking up from the New King James Version. So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel and it we crossed over that their hearts melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. Again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised 
but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness, did all the people who are men of war who came out of Israel, Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers that he would give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised their sons, whom he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, this day, this day, this day, this Valentine day, I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover and leavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the man assisted on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land. And the children of Israel no longer had manna. But they ate the produce of the land of Canaan that year. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked. Behold, a man stu stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say? To his servant. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we say thank you. Thank you because you are God. We thank you because you care for us. You cared for ye our yesterday. You are caring for our today. You will care for tomorrow. We pray, God, that by your Holy Spirit, speak to us at our various levels. At the end of it all, God, will give you all the glory. will give you all the honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I may not know why you came today to the service, but what I know is you are somewhere, you are somewhere, and God is taking you somewhere. Amen? Amen. You were somewhere, you are somewhere. And God is taking you somewhere. And that somewhere God is taking you to is definitely a better place than where you are. Than where you are. And that is God. Those who may not know me, I'm Charles Wafula Sikuku. Married to Ross Nabwana Sikuku, who is also in the house. I don't know if nations could be represented, but we'll discover as we move on. When you read the whole book of Joshua from chapter 1 up to the 24th chapter, you will realize that chapter 5 
appears to be different. Up chapter 5, he speaks of the past or speaks into the past. Chapter 5 speaks into the present and chapter 5 speaks into the future. And you will get the following seven acts. The act, it of course it begins with the act of crossing the Jordan River which melted the hearts of the kings that had or uh, were informed of that kind of uh, crossing. Then the second act is the act of circumcising the sons of Israel and they say at the heel of the foreskins. I do recall that in 1979 on 10th August I faced what others say the knife uh, and facing the knife it's not very interesting because you end up losing uh, what is part of you. And that's why they call it the hill of foreskins. Probably that year, if they collected out so many foreskins, they would have made a hill. And then following the same, God says, tells the children of Moses, Joshua, that I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt. The third act we see there is celebrating the Passover and this Passover celebration is on the 14th day of the first month and that first month in Hebrew is called Abib or Abfif. So Abib, the first month of, 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 of the, what, what they call ecclesiastical year uh, in Hebrew. And for seven days from the 14th, rolling down up to 21, they could not eat what they call unleavened bread. So they went up to 21st. So the fourth act we see there is the stoppage of manna falling from heaven and the children of Israel being given an opportunity to eat of what cross from the land. The fifth act we see is the certain appearance of a man when Joshua was by the Jericho. He, a certain man just appeared. So that is an act. That is an act. And this man had a sword in his hand ready for war. The sixth act we see is Joshua falling on the ground and worshiping this man who had now been, who had introduced himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. And remember, whenever angel, people attempted to worship the angels, they denied that opportunity. They denied those who wanted to worship them. So, and it's, therefore, it's only God uh, who can be worshipped. Then the seventh act we see there is when Joshua removes sandals from his feet. And that, that speaks almost like to the time when jo Moses was facing the burning bush which could not be consumed and, and he was also commanded by the angel of the Lord from the midst of, of, of the bush to remove his sandals. So from those five acts, we realize that circumcision at the heel of the foreskins transitioned the children of Israel from this Egypt season to the Canaan season. And that's why I came today to say we are transitioning from the Egypt season to the Canaan season. 
the Egypt season comes with seven disgraces and the Canaan season comes with seven graces. So by the time we see the seven disgraces or seven reproaches or the seven shame of Egypt, then we turn over to the seven graces of Canaan, you will now know I have finished my message and I would have delivered as God asked me to, to deliver. Amen? Amen. Then we, why do we talk of circumcision of the heart? Not the circumcision I went through on 10th of August 1978. When one looks at the Bible, in Jeremiah 17, 9, 10, the Bible, the Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And my heart, my heart is so deceitful and eh? desperately wicked. Who can know it? Then the answer comes, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. Jesus Christ came and advanced that agenda of the, the Jeremiah agenda in Matthew 15, 1 to 20, when he was answering the scribes and the Pharisees, and he's also saying the same today, that defilement comes from the heart. And that's why the heart has to be circumcised again and again. So we should not stop at the 40 days. We should circumcise it again and again. When we look at verse 16 of Matthew 15, 16 to 20, Jesus concluded the discussion in which we see the following. He said, are you also still without understanding? Do you, not, do, do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? Like some of me, like me, I like eating. So whenever I eat what I eat, it goes into the stomach and eventually it comes out. Uh, I, I, I like eating. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeded Proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Paul, in Romans 2, 28 to 29 gives us the definition of circumcision. He says circumcision is an inward process and of the heart and is done by the spirit of God. That is an interesting one. That it's an inward process and it is of the heart and it's done by the spirit of God. And when that is happening, actually it's a painful process. Even, even when the Holy Spirit circumcises one, it's a painful process. Because it will entail cutting off part of you and discarding it so that it becomes part of the heel of, 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 of the foreskin. And after circumcision, like the children of Israel actually remained in their, ten, in their tents in the camp until they were healed. But this healing was surprising because they crossed the Jordan River on the 10th day. By the 10th day, they had all crossed. And remember, by the 14th day, they had been circumcised and they had healed and they had joined in the celebration of the Passover. So you need to be aware that that was a strange thing. 
But the moment they crossed over, God told them, I know you are here, but you came from somewhere, and I'm taking you somewhere, and where I am taking you, you need to be circumcised of where you have come from. Amen? Let me remind you where they had come from. If you look at Exodus 14, 10 to 20, when the children of Israel were being pursued by, the, uh, by Pharaoh and his army, the fear gripped them. The fear gripped them to an extent that they, kept, they started crying and wondered why they had been taken out of Egypt. So that fear of the Egyptians actually drove them into what we call rebellion. They lacked faith in God to protect them. When we move forward to Exodus 16, 2 to 3, they ran out of food. And of course, I don't know if I was there, probably I would also have complained. They remember the Egyptian pots of meat and bread. And therefore, they lacked faith in God to provide for them. And when you move down to Exodus 17.3, they there was no water for both the humans and the animals. So they complained. They, they, did, they could not imagine probably God could provide for their water. When you move down, now this is on... Um, on, the, on Mount Sinai, Exodus 13, Exodus 32, sorry, 1 to 6, the moment Moses delayed on the mountain for 40 days, they said, no, we don't seem to have a leader. So they brought Aaron closer to replace Moses, hopefully, and they realized we need to make a God to replace God. Then the last one I want to mention is when they received a report, which is now in Numbers 14, 1 to 10, when they received a report by, from the 10, particularly the 10, these people revolted. They rebelled, uh, particularly when they heard of the descendants of Anak. And they said, let's choose a leader for ourselves and let's go back to Egypt. Of course, God testified of them in Exodus 32, 9, and he says, he says the following, I have seen these people, and indeed it's a stiff-necked people. Of course, other people, if you look at Abraham, the foreskins of Abraham's heart were Lot and Ismael. The four skins of the hearts of Jacob and his household were foreign gods, if you look at Genesis 35. The four skin of Moses' heart was the pride of the 40-year rule in the palace. The four skin of King David's heart was the nameless child born out of wedlock to King David by Bathsheba. Moving forward into the garden of Gethsemane, the foreskin of the three disciples was prayerlessness. If you took up the Jesus times, of course, that is also Jesus' times in the Garden of Gethsemane. And belief and burdensome religious traditions of elders were the foreskins of the people of the Israelites during Jesus' time. And of course, the foreskin of Ananias and Sapphira was lying to the Holy Spirit when they kept part of what was meant for God to themselves. Where are you and I? What are our foreskins? 
and I want to read to you what my four skins are. And you can also evaluate yourself. I'm of black race. And you may be, you may be, you may be one too, which is a good thing in the eyes of God. However, I've exalted my race to the extent that I look down upon other races. So the question is, where is God when I take pride in racism? Where is God when I take pride in racism? Pride in racism is a foreskin of the heart and therefore a facet of stiff nakedness. Number two, I am a Kenyan and you may be one too, which is a good thing in the eyes of God. However, I have exalted my nation to the extent that I look down upon other nations. Where is God when I pride in nationalism? Pride in nationalism is a foreskin of the heart. And therefore a facade, a, fac a facade of stiff nakedness. I said I'm, I'm speaking about myself. I'm from the western part of Kenya. And you may also hail from that region, which is a good thing in the eyes of God. However, I've exalted my region to extend that I look down upon other regions. Where is God when I take pride in regionalism? Therefore, pride in regionalism is a foreskin of the heart and therefore a facade of stiff nakedness. I'm of Ruya tribe and you may be one too. Let's see. Let me see if there are Ruyas in the house. You may be one too. Okay. Oh, oh. Ruyas. Of, definitely roses. They are. I see. Good. Uh -huh. However, I've exalted my tribe to the extent that I look down upon other tribes. Where is God when I pride in tribalism? Where is God when I pride in tribalism? Pride in tribalism, of course, is a foreskin. Then I also want to introduce to you, those of you who probably have not read my book, Stories in My Story. I'm of Bamanga clan. Of the Vukusu sub tribe. Now you understand I'm a Vukusu. And you may be too. Which is a good thing in the eyes of God because it's God who created me to belong to Bamanga and the Vukusu, Vukusu sub tribe. However, I have exalted my clan to the extent that I look down upon other Vukusu clans. Where is God when I take pride in clanism? I belong to Muse Albert Skuku family, and I don't know if there are any around. Of course, Rose is. However, I've exalted the Skuku family to the extent that I look down upon other Wanyama families. Where is God when I pride in familyism? Familyism. Of course, we started with racism, nationalism. Now we are talking of regionalism, tribalism. Now, clanism, and we have also moved to familyism. I'm a man, and you may be, you know, men at times we think, you know, men we think, you know, uh -huh. we, we think. So, I'm a man, and you may be too, which is a good thing. That I, however, I've exalted myself to the extent that I look down upon other individuals. Where is God when I take pride in the individualism? I'm a husband. Of course, Rose did know I would say this. I'm a husband and it's good to be a husband. It's good to be a husband. The only problem is I've exalted myself that I look down upon Rose on the basis of gender. So where is God when I take pride in genderism?
Racism, nationalism, regionalism, tribalism, clanism, familyism, individualism, and genderism are four skins or idols of the heart. And where they ex exist, there is no God. That is now the unfortunate part of it. Where it exists, there is no God. The story is the same when other attributes such as education, wealth, religion, traditions, personality traits, individual giftings. Probably if I'm, I, I, I walk in this, uh, the anointing God has given me, then I start looking down upon other people. For example, I may be having a chance to serve here. The, 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 the sweeper only gets a chance to serve here when they are uh, forgetting and nobody is seeing them. Then I imagine that uh, my gifting is better. The biggest worry is that these four skins or idols of the heart have slowly crept into the church and marriage institutions and the two institutions are being rocked from within. Of course, Galatians 5, 19 to 21, Paul talks of many others. I don't want to go into that. With the four skins of the heart, the following seven disgraces or reproaches or shame of Egypt come our way. Number one, the disgrace or reproach or shame of pride. So you can say pride. Of course, they say, the Bible says pride goes before destruction. Two, the disgrace and rip or the disgrace or reproach or shame of suffering defeat before our enemies in battle. The third one, the disgrace or reproach or shame of bondage or slavery in the hand of the Egyptians. Four, the disgrace or reproach or shame of empty handedness, which we call poverty. In that regard, the fear five, the disgrace or reproach or shame of famine, suffering famine. Six, the disgrace or reproach of or shame of prolonged plagues, sicknesses, and diseases. The disgrace or reproach or shame of premature deaths. So, what we are saying, the seven disgraces one is pride. Suffering to feed before enemies. Bondage or slavery in the hands of the Egyptians. Emptiness or poverty. Famine. Prolonged diseases, sicknesses and diseases. And then premature deaths. Premature deaths. If I ended there, I would have condemned us all. But uh, we are moving. <laughs> Relax. Because <laughs> you can feel there is a lot of tension in the house. But uh, God cannot send me here to judge. Because I cannot uh, uh, be in that seat. I want to look at the season now of the spirit of God. And seven graces. When the children of Israel were circumcised, that's why God said, I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt. It's like God separated them from the reproach of Egypt. And, and, and that's why you see what we call the heel of the four skins. And when that was done, actually God gave them, to each of them a new heart and a new spirit. They became God's people, and God became their God. In the case of Abraham, he separated himself from the Lord. Of course, the moment he did that, he was able to see the inheritance around it. When you look at Jacob in Genesis 35, he separated, they separated themselves from the foreign gods which they buried and forgot about them. When it came to David, actually the nameless child died. 
And when that happened and he was given a new heart, he went to the house of God and worshipped. He comforted Patshepa, his wife. He made love to Patshepa, who bore him Solomon, the beloved of the Lord. The one we know God gave the name Jedidiah. 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 Then he proceeded together with the men of war to defeat the Ammonites and collected great spoil of war. And of course, they returned to Jerusalem in celebrations, and that is what happened. Of course, when you look at Peter, when he preached and the congregation was cut to heart, they were able, they were able to separate themselves from drunkenness of religion and traditions of men of, or, or, or elders for that matter. So when we allow ourselves, when we allow the Holy Spirit to separate us from the, the four skins of our hearts, these are the seven graces that come our way. The first one is the grace of humility. The grace of humility. I will dwell on this one a little, but I will uh, let me move forward. I give us each of them first. The grace of humility. Then the second one, the grace of winning battles and subduing our enemies. The grace of winning battles and subduing our enemies. Number three, the grace of disinheriting and inheriting as well as dwelling in the land. The grace of disinheriting and inheriting as well as dwelling in the land. Then number four, the grace of accessing treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. I will go back for uh, some time. The grace of eating the good of the land. The grace of healing. The grace of long life. For the sake of those who are writing, because some of us are teachers uh, uh, taught by the Holy Spirit. I didn't go to a training school like uh, I saw Madam Principal around when she was worshiping God. Amen. I didn't go. I was just trained by the Holy Spirit to be a teacher. That the grace of humility, then the grace, the grace of winning battles and subduing our enemies, the grace of inheriting and disinheriting as well as dwelling in the land, the grace of accessing treasures, wealth of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, the grace of eating the good of the land, the grace of healing, the grace of long life. So I'm um, in other words saying that 2021 God has said before us the seven graces because he wants to roll away the seven disgraces that we looked at so that we walk into the season the season of the seven graces the grace of humility the grace of which one do you remember of winning battles and subduing our enemies the grace of disinheriting and inheriting as well as dwelling in this land called Kenya of course some of us your land may not be Kenya some of you may your land may be elsewhere so may God open your eyes to see your land. Those of us who know that Kenya is our land, here we are settled. We are sitting at Panduki, but some of you may relocate to U.S. It's a good thing. To Canada, it's a good thing. Even to Rwanda, it's a good thing. Even to Uganda, it's a good thing. But you need that grace. That grace. That grace, the grace of accessing treasures of darkness. You know, you know, these, these Israelites, they never worked. All they did was they just went into war and collected the spoils. Went into war and collected the, the spoils. Therefore, God wants to just simply make men and women of war. 
So that when we just go into war, our worries and treasures are on the battlefield. That's all that God wants, us, wants to do. Don't think that you need to work so hard. Eh? That's so hard for money to come your way. If it was like that, then I will not be where I am. It, has, it was just because of the grace of God. If you want to know, pick the book titled Stories and My Story and you will also realize that at one time, I lacked fear. I had to walk from the city center to Ziru where I was staying temporarily as Rose was in there. Then I also lacked food. I had to borrow 20 shillings. The man you are seeing. Most of you just see us drive here and you imagine we just were born driving. We were born looking this smart. No! Well, it's not that. God, God has done it. And he will do it for you. Amen. Amen. I want to look at the minute a little and then uh, probably two minutes then I conclude uh, for sake of time. The grace of humility. By the time the children of Israel were being circumcised, they were being referred to as sons of Israel. But when you move down to Joshua 6.3, Joshua 6.8.3, Joshua 10.7, Joshua 11.7, this group is name changes and it changes to men of war, mighty men of valor, people of war. And with this group, Joshua conquered 31 kings. 31 kings. So the question is, do we have mighty men and men of valor or of valor now? The answer is yes, but a few of them we only have what? A few of them. Do we still require more mighty men and women of war or of valor now and going forward? The answer is a resounding yes. The only unfortunate thing, you must avail yourself to be circumcised of the foreskin of our hearts. So, when Joshua lifted up his eyes, by the Jericho, he was able to see a man. Before that, there was no man who had come his way. There was no man. So that tells me that the humility, when we humble ourselves, it removes blindness from our eyes and we are able to see help that has been sent our way. The grace of humility removes blindness. When he fell down and worshipped, and worshipped, of course, after, after, after having been, uh, been uh, the, the, the commander, having been, the man having been introduced as the commander, and he therefore accepted his worship, it's like when in humility we surrender to God, and in irrespective of what we are going through, we are able to worship him, to give him worship. And it's in worship that our needs are made. When he removed his sandals, meaning he connected to the holy, he was in the presence of God. That tells me that humility connects you to God and enables you to abide in his presence. Amen. When, you know, these people, when they conquered Jericho, it's like everything, whatever that was not destroyed, was supposed to be for God. And I imagine these were poor people. So, you know, Maureen, you know, a poor person, if I was a poor one, and I've seen money, I imagine it should be mine first, okay? And they just like the folly part. Okay. But Joshua, what they did is that that first thing they gave it to God. 
It's only in humility that we can give to God first. Of course, then that brings in Matthew 6.33. Of course, at one moment, Ajahn did what I've just said. He decided to keep to himself some few things. But when the man of God, when they suffered a defeat at AI, he was able to fall on the ground and cry to God. So it's like when he did that, it's like he was seeking intervention, divine intervention. So humility helps us in whichever situations we find ourselves to seek divine intervention. And of course, they went on and expunged the evil from their midst. So humility helps us to obey the instructions of God. Number seven, Caleb went to him. He listened to him. He blessed him and he granted his request. It's only in humility that we can attend to the needs of other people. It's only in humility. Number eight, when most of us like quoting that, quoting that and Joshua says, me and my household, me mean a rose in our to wait to our daughter, nation is to, we shall worship God. So it's only in humility that it's the grace of humility that enables us to serve God. To serve God. Therefore, conclusion. Because I have 30 seconds. It's in circumcising the foreskin of your heart again and again that, we, that God will respond to and give you a humble heart. A heart after God's own heart. A, a pure or a clean heart. A new heart. And a new spirit. And that is the gear for mounting up in 2021. The gear for mounting up in 2021 is a humble heart. A heart after God's own heart. A new heart. A new spirit. Or, or, in fact, if you are looking at Psalms 51, you will see what David says, David says, create in me a pure or a clean heart, depending on. But when you are looking at uh, Ezekiel 36, then you will see a new heart and a new spirit. So the gear, that is the gear for mounting up. Mounting up in 2021, therefore, is about a humble heart. And this is what God gave to Moses. Numbers 12, 23. And the purpose of that is for service. So we are mounting up in service. Mounting up in service. And when we serve, the graces, the seven graces come our way. Mounting up is therefore about, it's about a heart after God's own heart. And this is what God said of David through Samuel, 1 Samuel 13, 14. And of course it's for service. Mounting up is about praying to God to create in you and in me a pure and clean heart. And to also renew a steadfast spirit within you and within me. As David prayed in Psalms 51. And the whole purpose is service. Mounting up in 2021, we therefore take God first to remove the foreskins of our hearts. And give us a new heart, a new spirit. And with that, we will serve. And as we serve, we shall mount. That the same was echoed. I don't want to go into that. The same was echoed by Jesus in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 13 to 12. For example, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. When you talk of the poor in spirit, it's about the heart condition. And all the nine, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we say thank you. Thank you because it's you who gave to overseer the theme mounting up. And today you have told us that it's the humble heart. It's the heart after your own heart. It's the new heart. 
the new spirit that is the gear for us to mount up. Therefore, today, God, help us, give us this new gear for us to mount up, for us to walk into the seven graces of the Canaan season. And therefore, as your servant, I want to decree that now we have entered into our Canaan season and the seven graces are here for us in Jesus' name. Receive you us. Receive you us. Receive you us. Receive you us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are blessed.